three uh, is the U.S. Constitution. So we're going to look at, um, you know, kind of the process of how the Founding Fathers got to these ideas, um, what the Constitution says. Um, we'll talk about the articles of the Constitution in this chapter, and then we have a separate chapter about civil liberties where we will talk about uh, the Bill of Rights. So to start with, <clears throat> our Constitution was written in 1789, and when it was written, this is what the United States looked like. These were the states that made up uh, the new, this new country. Um, there were 13 original states. And so when our founding fathers sit down to write this document, it, they create something that does not look like anything else that exists in the world. Um, there's not really any country that takes all of these ideas and puts them in their governing document. Like we said in the uh, first chapter, most countries at this time in uh, the European world and in Asia and other places still had monarchies or emperors or things like that. And so the United States integrates some different philosophies about democracy, liberty, freedom, self-determination, all of those things. And so we start <clears throat> as a colony. And so we know from being a colony, our history is a colony, that there's some things we don't want uh, when we create our own, uh, our own country. Um, you know, as a colony, England... Um, kind of ignored the United States for a long time, or those colonies that would become the United States, um, which led to them kind of creating their own institutions before they even wrote the, con the Constitution. Um, so they had some ideas of how they wanted things to go. Um, one of the things that they were most passionate about was representation. If you know much about the Revolutionary War, you know, one of the battle cries was no taxation without representation. And what that was about was England imposing these taxes and things on the colonies, and yet they didn't have anyone in Parliament who represented their interest. And so uh, representation became a big part of the Constitution, that every state would be represented. Um, but we'll talk about how that breaks down here in a minute. Um, economic opportunity. There was a lot of economic opportunity to be had in the what would become the United States. Um, you know, there was plenty of opportunity for uh, creating businesses, for changing your station in life, uh, for pressing westward and, and, you know, discovering your fortune and all that kind of stuff. So there was kind of this limitless potential for what the United States could become. Um, many colonies already had compacts and covenants where they were working together. Uh, our compacts are like mutual agreements between the states to, say, recognize contracts or business dealings or enforce each other's laws, things like that. Uh, covenants were kind of religious agreements with the citizens, um, but these became kind of blueprints for what the Constitution would be, how the states would work together. Um, they already had some experience here working together as colonies. Uh, of course, freedom of religion was a big part of this. We know that the original um, white settlers of what would become the United States Many of them, uh, their uh, ancestors came here uh, for religious freedom, to practice a different form of Christianity than what uh, England practiced, uh, than what uh, the Catholic Church wanted uh, to see. So religious freedom has kind of been with us since the beginning. And then uh, there were many colonists who wanted a strong central government because they wanted guarantees for their claims on their land for to protect them from not just the the English but also the other interests that were staking their claims in North America such as the Spanish the French and then of course there were plenty of conflicts with the Native Americans who they were taking land from so uh, many people wanted a, a central government that was strong enough to protect them from those other interests 
So, <clears throat> why did the colonists initially revolt? Uh, one thing that we don't talk a lot about is, you know, the it took a lot for the colonists to eventually revolt against the British government. They tried numerous ways of compromising and working out agreements with the British government. But the problem was, was that the king didn't really have any interest in compromise. Most kings don't. Um, so, like we said, for, for a long time, uh, the colonies were kind of ignored. Uh, they weren't, uh, they, they weren't heavily imposed on with rules, regulations, and taxes. But that starts to change because England... France, the Native American tribes, they're all starting to compete for uh, land. Uh, there's conflict over, you know, who controls what and things like that. And so as a result of this, um, you know, not only is the British government trying to, um, you know, spread its influence in North America, you know, the British Empire is massive. They're, you know, the British will eventually... Um, set up colonies in India, they have colonies in South America, they have colonies all over the world. And along with that comes debt. Uh, you need to feed troops, you need to build ships, you need, you need lots of money to maintain an empire. And so by 1763, the British start stationing troops permanently in the colonies uh, they start taxing the colonists uh, to raise more revenue. Um, and this is to pay for war, to pay for the expansion of the empire, things that the colonists really didn't see a direct benefit from. And so not only are they taxing the colonists heavier, uh, but they're also expecting the colonists to take care of their soldiers that they are stationing in North America. And so this is where the colonists start to finally say, okay, we need to have some conversations. We need to have some dialogue about this. And like we said, it really starts around the idea of representation. Um, the, the North American colonists have no representation in parliament, nobody arguing for their interest, arguing against oppressive taxes and things like that. And that's where that phrase comes from, the no taxation without representation. Um, the colonists felt that if there were going to be these new taxes imposed on them, that they should have a delegate representing them, uh, someone who will be voting on their behalf in Parliament. Um, this is what we call delegate representation, somebody who is truly trying to represent the interest of the people who elect them to office. Instead... Uh, what England has in Parliament is trustee representation. The elected officials do what is best for the country and the citizens, uh, at least as far as they believe. So whatever they believe is best for the whole country and all of the citizens, especially the wealth and the power of the British Empire, that's what they're going to do. And so they don't believe in this delegate representation. They're going to do... Uh, what is in the best interest of the country. And because the colonists are so far apart from England, they don't really reap any of those benefits. And so this is where the conflict really starts. Uh, this image on the right, you may be familiar with it. It's been a bit distorted today in, in modern uh, movements and things like that. But this is the Gadsden flag. And what this flag represents is... The snake is supposed to represent the colonies, and the, the don't tread on me is kind of a warning. It means don't uh, try and impose things on me I don't want. Don't try and uh, force me to pay more in taxes, whatever it is. And so the snake represents the colonies uh, being coiled and ready to attack. And so this flag was meant as a warning to England, like, don't mess with us because we're not just going to sit there and take it. So some of the, the British essentially ignore a lot of these concerns. And so um, they are in conflict with the French in North America. Uh, the French and the Native Americans are at war over control of land to the west of the colonies and up into Canada. Um, 
the British uh, essentially reach some agreements with the Native Americans where they won't allow the colonies to push westward, uh, and they will work together with the tribes to undermine the French. But this really upsets the colonists because many of them moved to the to the colonies, or many people came to the colonies for that promise of opportunity that the West represented, whether it was gold or land or whatever it was. The frontier was this, the idea of the frontier was that there was so much opportunity to be had. So the British making this agreement to not push westward upset the colonists because it undermined the reason many of them came to the colonies in the first place. Um, England also imposes some rules on the colonies uh, to where they can only trade and do business with England. And so any other business with other countries is essentially deemed illegal. And so the reason why this is a problem is because if you only have one you know, country you can trade with, then they can charge you whatever they want. Uh, they can impose whatever taxes they want. And you don't really have any power to uh, try and uh, ha you know, make better arrangements with someone else. And so um, you know, the, the British were getting rich from sugar in the Caribbean, uh, tea from uh, the East and things like that. Um, but the, the colonists wanted to trade with some of these places directly and establish their own uh, agreements, but the, the, the British monarchy essentially says, no, this is illegal. And one of the first taxes that really upsets the colonists is the Stamp Act of 1765. So um, the British apply a tax to government seals that are required for documents. So let's say that you're, you own a business and you want to uh, draft a contract with someone for a business relationship. Well, any official document had to be officially stamped with the seal of the British government or British representatives there in the colonies. And so essentially to do any kind of business, you have to pay this tax to the British government to make your uh, contracts and your business documents official. And so this upsets the colonists because not only now can they not trade and do business with anyone but England, but now even the business that they're doing with one another is being heavily taxed by the British. And so um, they convene a meeting called the Stamp Act Congress to essentially uh, draft a document of protest and send some demands uh, to the King of England and to Parliament. Um, the Stamp Act is so disliked that it leads to protest in the streets, British tax collectors start to be attacked by people, uh, and this image here um, is affixed to different documents and envelopes and things where the stamp would go as a show of protest against this tax. Then, <clears throat> following the Stamp Act, we get uh, what are called the Townsend Acts. Uh, the Townsend Acts are another round of taxes um, on the colonists. Uh, it creates an American board of customs that essentially will decide how much taxes should be paid on goods that are being uh, imported and exported out of the colonies. Um, New York was also uh, pushing back against this, and New York was refusing to house and supply British troops. And so, you know, all of these taxes that the colonists believe are undermining their their autonomy, their freedom, you know, their chances at, at opportunity in, in the colonies. And so they start to push back. And it's, it's mainly uh, protest in the streets. People start to get into skirmishes with British soldiers and things like that. But it really uh, comes to, uh, you know, a boiling point uh, on March 5th, 1770, which we know as the Boston Massacre. Um, there was a meeting at, in Boston at what's called the townhouse, which was kind of like a meeting place. Uh, and they had gathered there to talk about how much they disliked 
these taxes, uh, you know, and these these uh, rules that were being forced upon them, and to start talking about what they could do uh, even further uh, to push back against these taxes. Um, and so a group of people leave the townhouse in, in Boston, and they turn the corner and run right into a group of British soldiers. And so they're already fired up, you know, from from the meeting they just attended. And so they start taunting the soldiers, throwing sticks, throwing rocks, throwing snow at them. And one of the soldiers panics, and they all open fire and kill five people. Um, five people are killed at the Boston Massacre. And one thing that, that a lot of people don't know is that the first person killed... Uh, was a man named Crispus Attucks, who was an African-American man uh, who was at this meeting uh, talking about how the colonists should uh, protest and push back against uh, the British government. Uh, another gentleman named Natick Indian is also killed. He's a Native American. And so these two men are among the first five people and these five uh, killed, and these five individuals are considered the first people to die. Uh, for the cause of American independence. So one thing that a lot of people don't know is that the first person that died in the in the cause of American independence was an African American man. And so this is just some of that stuff that we don't tend to talk about when we're teaching this stuff uh, in high school and things like that. Uh, but the Boston Massacre leads to outrage among the American colonists. And so... Um, you know, a, a lot of things start happening. And one of the things that happens is, you know, tea is a huge business at this time. And one of the biggest companies in England is the East India Company. Um, <clears throat> the East India Company was on the verge of bankruptcy at this time. And so the, the East India Company, their affairs were heavily intertwined with the British government. So the British government couldn't let the East India Company fail because it could affect the entire economy of the British Empire. So the British uh, Empire agrees to repeal the Townsend Acts except for one tax, and that is the tariff on tea. And so it may seem kind of silly to us today, unless you're from the South, but tea was very serious back then. Iced tea is very serious to us today, but I don't know that we would go to war over it. Uh, but back then, um, this this tax remains for importing tea. And remember, the, the, the British are only allowing them to, to trade with England, so they're being forced to buy this tea. Uh, and essentially, this tax is, only exists to prop up the East India Company and prevent them uh, from going into bankruptcy. Um, so, <clears throat> East India ships make their way to the colonies. They first attempt to dock in Philadelphia and New York, but there are protesters and mobs at the docks that chase them away. And so... Uh, as a result, they don't have anywhere to go. And so they, they're like, we've got to dock somewhere. We've got to get this cargo unloaded. And so the governor of Boston assures them that they can dock in Boston and unload their cargo. Uh, unbeknownst to the governor, a group uh, known as the Sons of Liberty uh, were formulating a plan. And the, the Sons of Liberty were led by Samuel Adams, the same Samuel Adams from the beer, uh, and he was one of the earliest of what we consider the founding fathers to call for full independence. The, the men who were part of the Sons of Liberty wanted full independence from England and had already started pushing for that before the other colonists were, were comfortable with that idea. So the Sons of Liberty, led by Samuel Adams, they decide that when these ships uh, dock in, in the Boston Harbor that they're going, they dress up like uh, Mohawk Native Americans and they essentially that evening raid the docks. Uh, they assault British soldiers. Some are killed. Uh, they throw 342 chests of tea into the Boston Harbor. Uh, if we account for inflation, today that tea would be worth between $1.5 and $2.5 million. That's how valuable this cargo is. And so, you know, this 
is considered, you know, one of the first acts of violence um, that kind of leads, puts us on the path uh, for revolution. And so uh, the, uh, this is the Boston Tea Party, which we're, we're taught about. What we're not taught about it is, is the level of violence that was used. Um, you know, Samuel Adams was not a man to uh, mince his words. He was all for the use of violence uh, against British troops, uh, taking the life of British troops to, for their cause. And so, you know, a lot of times today when we're talking about protest, uh, we we hear this this common refrain that you know yes we agree with protest but violence is never justified except people tend to forget that violence is what we use to f- found our country that when these men had reached the point where they couldn't take their oppression any longer they resorted to violence and without that violence our country wouldn't exist so you know. Uh, we, we like to say today that violence is never justified, but we've seen, we tend to easily forget, uh, you know, how our country was founded just over 200 and some odd years ago. So uh, that's, that's a debate that we'll have in, in some other classes. But, you know, the use of violence, is it ever justified? Well, uh, you have to look at these incidents that lead up to our independence and really carefully consider that, that idea. Um. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> leading up to the revolution, the, the Boston Tea Party, in response to the Boston Tea Party, England passes more acts, which the colonists uh, referred to as the Intolerable Acts. They completely shut down Boston Harbor until the colonists pay the British government back for the tea. They abolish town meetings, so the colonists are not allowed together for meetings anymore. They force the colonists to quarter soldiers in their own home, and they put the entire state of Massachusetts under military control. And so this action is considered intolerable. The the colonists can no longer sit by and allow this to happen. So they call for a meeting, the First Continental Congress, September 1774, Uh, Twelve colonies send delegates and call for a boycott of British goods. And they essentially commit themselves to the idea that men are entitled to the rights of life, liberty, and property. Um, They agree that they're going to meet again in May 1775. So they want to give some time uh, to see how the boycott works. Uh, submit some more demands to the British government, and then, you know, agree to meet uh, again in May, uh, which is about, what was that, seven or eight months, uh, to see how this all works out. Before they can have that second meeting, fighting breaks out between colonists and the British Army. Um, And this incident, uh, Lexington and Concord, it's referred to as the shot heard round the world. Um, this is considered the moment that the revolution starts. Um, now, shot heard round the world. Why would it be the shot heard round the world? Why would the entire world care about this? Um, <clears throat> it's argued that th- this moment in history, our revolution is kind of a turning point for other places around the world. So if we look at what happens here and in the revolution, uh, starting with Lexington and Concord, uh, a thousand British soldiers are sent from Boston. They're marching to Concord, uh, where the armory is, to seize the arms of the colonists, uh, to essentially take away their guns so that they can't fight back. Um, Armed colonists block the road to Concord, Uh, to prevent the British uh, troops from making it there and seizing the arms. Uh, Fighting breaks out between the troops and the colonists. Um, And to this day, we still do not know who fired the first shot in this conflict. But that shot, you know, this, this conflict being referred to as the shot heard around the world. We, the, the colonists are a very small group of people compared to the British Army. 
uh, they're they're untrained, they're underarmed. Uh, most of them have never fought in a military conflict. Uh, but the United States is able to fight the British and win their independence. And so it kind of sends this signal uh, to the rest of the world that if you are a colony, you can stand up and do this yourself. The British uh, or uh, England, the, the British Empire was the largest empire in the world at this time. And this ragtag group of colonists in what becomes the United States are able to beat them. And so after our revolution and after we write our constitution, many other places in the world follow suit. We have revolutions all over South America, Central America, the Caribbean, uh, places in Africa. So it is kind of like the first domino that starts this chain reaction uh, around the world. Um, but at Lexington and Concord, uh, British soldiers do make it to Concord, destroy the weapons, but on their way back to Boston, militiamen are hiding uh, and start attacking them and kill 300 British soldiers. And one thing that the colonists do, this, this isn't really important to government, but the colonists don't fight formally the way the British do. They use more kind of guerrilla tactics where they hide in the woods, they use snipers and things like that, whereas the British fight very formally, where you line up in a field a, a par, across the field from your opponent, you agree to terms and all this kind of stuff. Well, the Americans knew that they couldn't win that kind of battle, so they resorted to other tactics to win this war. Now, the Second Continental Congress meets uh, in May 1775. Uh, now we have delegates from all 13 colonies, and this becomes kind of the acting government uh, for the revolution. And the Declaration of Independence is drafted and adopted on July 4th, 1776. And so, again, that's another misconception a lot of people have. July 4th, 1776 is not celebrating when we win the revolution. It's celebrating the day that we declared our independence. We hadn't won our independence, but it is the day we declare our independence. Um, but the Declaration of Independence, many of you have probably uh, had to read it for classes or things like that. I uh, highly recommend reading it if you have not. Um, but this is where the idea of what our country will become is kind of laid out on paper. And so some of the principles that are laid out in the Declaration, all people are created equal. Uh, the Creator endows men with rights that cannot be taken away. Uh, those rights are things like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Government uh, exists to protect those rights, and that government should derive its power and authority from the people. Now, we know that as a country, after we win our revolution and our independence, that we don't live up to all of these values for a very long time. And many people would argue that we're still not living up to some of these values today. Number one is the most glaringly obvious. All people are created equal. Thomas Jefferson writes that while owning 600 slaves. So, uh, no, all people were not equal, despite the fact that we put it down in fancy language on a piece of paper. Uh, so, they're great ideas. The problem is, is that it will be a very long time before we truly live up to these ideas. Uh, grievances that are laid out in the Declaration. Um, the British had violated the colonists' right to representation. Uh, the army is not under civilian control. Instead, it is under the control of the king. Um, so in the United States today, our army is under civilian control because Congress decides when we go to war, not the military itself. Um, and then three, loss of independent courts. Uh, if you were a colonist, you were not entitled to a fair trial. The king decided your guilt or innocence, and that is, you know, that is what the law of the land was. So um, all of this will, all of these ideas in the Declaration will go on to, to form the Constitution. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the Constitution is not our first form of government. 
we actually try a different form of government first before we draft the Constitution. And that is the Articles of Confederation. So our first attempt at government is actually a failure. And we don't talk about it a whole lot. And, and a lot of people make it through high school government classes without ever learning about the Articles of Confederation. Um, now, when we talk about a confederation, uh, most people know the term because of the Confederacy from the Civil War. But a confederation is a group of independent states that yield some power to a national government but each state retains its sovereign authority, meaning that the state's government has the most authority within those boundaries, within the state. Um, a good example of this would be the European Union. Um, each country is sovereign and makes its own laws and its own rules, but they do surrender some authority to the EU government to maintain currency, come up with economic agreements that benefit everyone. Um, and so they work together in those capacities where it is beneficial. But within their country, they are still sovereign. So this is how the United States functioned in the beginning. Um, state legislatures expanded and from state to state, there would be different laws, different rights, and things like that. So just because you were entitled to a right or something in Massachusetts does not mean it would be the same if you went to Georgia. Um, and then, of course, slavery was already starting to divide the country. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance is passed uh, in 1787, and essentially what it does is it outlaws the institution of slavery in any Western territories. Um, and then there would become, you know, lots of conflict over new states that were admitted as to whether they would be admitted as uh, states where slavery was permitted or states that uh, did not want slavery. Um, but in the Confederation, uh, the, the Articles of Confederation and the Confederation uh, of the States, um, the problems uh, showed up pretty quickly. Uh, one, the national government, the national Congress could not assess taxes. So you paid taxes to your state, but you did not pay taxes to the central government. The biggest problem with this is that people were still demanding things of, of the central government. They wanted protection via an army. Uh, they wanted uh, courts to resolve uh, issues and things like that. But they didn't give them the money to solve these problems. And so you can't maintain a standing army to protect your country if your central government can't assess taxes, which is used to pay your soldiers. Um, two, impossible to amend the articles because they needed unanimous consent. So you had to get all 13 of the states to agree to an amendment before it could be added to the Articles of Confederation. Well, you've got states with very different cultures, very different issues. You've got states that are pro-slavery, anti-slavery. So it would be impossible to get all 13 to agree. Uh, state legislatures uh, became corrupt because they had very few checks and balances on the, the powers of the people who were elected. And then uh, the weak national government could not really develop relationships with foreign countries, and it left us open to attack. And we would go to war again uh, pretty shortly in the, you know, with the Spanish-American War and things like that. But we didn't have a central government um, kind of running the show, and so that kind of signaled to the rest of the world that if they wanted to attack us or invade us, we would be vulnerable to that because we didn't have... Uh, a central government that was maintaining our army or holding uh, this, you know, everything together. Now, the, the incident that really brings to the, everyone's attention that, that the Articles of Confederation don't work uh, is Shea's Rebellion. Uh, Daniel Shea was a captain in the revolution, uh, and he led uh, a rebellion in Massachusetts in 1786 uh, of many uh, farmers and, and other individuals who had fought uh, in the revolution, but now they had come back home, 
Uh, they had their, their land and their property was being foreclosed on because, you know, while they were away fighting the revolution, they weren't getting paid. Um, they essentially left the land that they owned to their families to upkeep. They went and fought the revolution and they came home and many of them had lots of debt. And now you have a new state that's assessing taxes and things like that. Um, and so they were very upset, uh, about, uh, you know, their property being seized and, and all of that stuff. And so Daniel Shea leads a group of these people uh, to rebel against the Massachusetts state government. They shut down courthouses, seize the armory of the state, essentially shut down business in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, the federal government could not intervene because they did not have an army to do so. Uh, they did not have the resources to do so. And so, you know, Massachusetts is telling them, we need you to send help. And they're like, you know, no money, who this? Because they, they had no way of helping out because they weren't allowed to tax and raise revenue. Um, so this really highlights the problem of having a weak central government. Um, and so Massachusetts eventually is able to raise enough money to essentially pay kind of a uh, mercenary type force to put this rebellion down. Um, but it really highlights the problems with the Articles of Confederation. And in spring 1787, delegates convene a closed meeting to discuss a new way of governing the United States. And of course, that will be the Constitutional Convention. Um, <clears throat> on May 25th, 1787, Representatives of the 13 states meet in Philadelphia to attempt to create a new style of government um, that is not the Articles of Confederation. We refer to these individuals as the founding fathers or sometimes the framers of the Constitution. Now, there's a lot of things about these men that we tend to not talk about. Um, so just before we start here, talking about the Constitution, let's talk about these men. The majority of these men were in their 20s and 30s. Uh, so when we look at these paintings of them, or we think about, you know, the individuals who created this country, we tend to think of these old men with white hair uh, founding our country. But that's not the truth. The truth is, is that most of these guys were your age uh, and were tasked with creating a new government. The oldest was... Uh, ben Franklin, who was 81, which was very much an anomaly uh, in 1787 to live to the age of 81. Um, but, you know, th this idea that, you know, the older you are, the wiser you are, and, and we tend to elect politicians who are over the age of 40 and things like that. Well, that's not who founded our country. Young people founded our country. Um, of these men, 17 of these delegates were slave owners, including Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Um, so we talk a lot about the language in the Constitution. We, the people, find these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, it's a bit ironic to write that sentence when you own slaves. And so, again, this is a conversation that we're having more and more today about how do we recognize these men, how, what is, you know, how do we teach about these men? And we have to teach about, you know, what they did right, but also what they did wrong. And so we have to acknowledge that these men uh, were not always the best men. Uh, you know, you can't hold another human being in slavery and really be an honorable person. Uh, now, they did something amazing, uh, but it doesn't overshadow, you know, owning other human beings. And so we have to always think about these men realistically. We tend to kind of deify them and talk about them like gods uh, in our country. And how dare you go against what the founding fathers would have wanted? Well, the thing is, the founding fathers had flaws. They were flawed men. Um, you know, they, you know, the, the institution of slavery is evil, whether you like it or not. And so these men, we have to look at them realistically. Uh, 31 of them had a college education, 
Uh, seven of them had signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, the true intent of, of creating the Constitution, we tend to, again, kind of the, – the way we talk about the framers, the founders, um, we tend to talk about them in these like uh, epic you know, ways about how they were just you know, almost like gods – but the fact of the matter is most of them were in favor of creating the Constitution simply to preserve their economic interest. And so uh, a lot of their motivation was not about equality and freedom and liberty and all that kind of stuff. It was about maintaining their money. And so um, we'll talk about you know, how that leads to problems later on down the line. Now, when the, the groups show up to this convention, there are two primary plans that are being debated. Uh, there is the Virginia plan, which is favored by larger states and especially by the southern states. And then we have the New Jersey plan, which is favored by smaller states. Uh, <clears throat> so the Virginia plan, which was proposed by Edmund Randolph and written by James Madison, called for a European-style nation-state where power was derived from the people. So in their version, the people would get to vote uh, and included ideas such as the creation of a powerful central government with three branches, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial, uh, a two-legislature um, Congress that one where it would be elected directly by the people, and the second where the representatives would be chosen by the state legislatures. And this is what we get in the beginning. We get a house of representatives that will be directly elected by the people. And then the Senate, in the beginning of our country, the Senate uh, senators are chosen by the state legislatures. They're not elected by the people. But uh, it establishes the idea of having two houses of Congress. And then their third suggestion is a legislature with the power to uh, select the executive and the judiciary. We do not use this idea. Um, essentially, they were advocating for the Congress electing the president and the judges. And so we do not use that idea. But we do keep the first two. The New Jersey plan... Uh, New Jersey and Connecticut preferred the way things were under the Articles of Confederation with some slight modifications. Well, under the Articles of Confederation, all states were sovereign and powerful within their own borders, so it would make sense for smaller states to want that because in a system like the Virginia Plan, bigger states would have more influence. And so... Uh, their first idea, strengthen the articles rather than replace them. Two, create one house of legislature with one vote for each state and a representative chosen by the state legislature. Uh, three, give Congress the power to raise revenue from the duties on imports and postal service fees. Uh, and number four, create a Supreme Court with members appointed for life by the executive branch. So from the New Jersey plan, we take ideas three and four. And so um, the, one of the points of contention becomes uh, how Congress, what Congress should look like. And so this is what we call the Great Compromise. So obviously the small states want a Congress where all the states are equal. The larger states want a Congress where representation is determined by population. And so bigger states would have more of a say-so. So what they come to is a compromise where they will have both. Uh, so in the Great Compromise, the House of Representatives is created and each state gets one representative per 30,000 citizens and they would be elected directly by the people and the House of Representatives would have the power to create bills to become law, uh, and the House will control the pocketbook. They will control the money. So any spending that the United States does has to typically originate in the House of Representatives. The Senate, uh, in the Senate, all states are equal. We get 
two senators no matter how big your state is. So we're all equal. Uh, in the beginning, like I said, senators are selected by state legislatures. It will not be till sometime later where we change this to direct election by the people. Um, power will be divided between state government and national government, but the national government would be supreme. And we'll talk about this more in a minute. Now, this is what's called the Great Compromise, because, uh, you know, the, there were competing interests, not just be based on population, but, uh, you know, based on economic interest and ways of life and things like that. But then this leads us into a bigger problem. In the House of Representatives, who is counted as a citizen? And this leads us to one of the darker things that makes its way into the Constitution. And that is the three-fifths compromise. <clears throat> so not only were the states divided on the institution of slavery and whether it is moral, but also the imbalance of power it creates between the states. Um, the southern states rely on slave labor for their plantation, for, for their plantations, I'm sorry, uh, which is the source of their economic power and strength. Um, so they have an edge on the northern states. Any state that has slavery essentially has free labor, which keeps them economically powerful. Um, but also, uh, there's a dis disagreement over how slaves should be counted towards the total population of the state. Because if slaves are fully counted, it will give slave states far more power in the House of Representatives. So they have to come to some agreement. And so the North, you know, it, the South made it very clear that if there was any talk of ending the institution of slavery, that they would get up and walk away from the convention. And so the, the Northern uh, representatives did not want the talks to fall apart. So what the North agrees to is to allow for slavery to exist for 20 more years uh, in the United States, and they would not put an export tax on cotton, which was the South's uh, biggest cash crop, in exchange for the South uh, only requiring a majority vote on navigation laws. Navigation laws were a big deal back then. Today, not as much. So, um, you know, basically the North had, you know, they only needed a majority vote to establish trade rules and, and uh, shipping and importing and exporting and that kind of stuff. Um, the national government would also have the power to regulate foreign commerce. So any business done with foreign countries would be regulated by the federal government, and the Senate would ratify treaties with foreign governments with a two-thirds vote. And the compromise is what we call the three-fifths compromise. So to deal with this issue of population, they agree to a compromise where slaves are only counted as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of population and taxation. So essentially... What they did was they wrote into the Constitution the idea that some people's lives were not as valuable as others, that a slave life only counted for three-fifths of a white life. And so um, they essentially write inequality into a document that starts with the sentence, we the people hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, unless you're not white. So uh, there, this is one of the biggest conflicts in the Constitution, is that we write inequality into a document that is supposed to believe all men are created equal. And this is probably one of the worst things we have done as a country and one of the darker parts of our history. And of course, we'll go on to lead to the Civil War, uh, segregation, civil rights, all that kind of stuff that we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, the structure of the Constitution. I don't expect you to memorize these or anything like that, but there's a lot of information here to write about. 
Uh, but Article 1 establishes the legislative branch and what the requirements are to be elected to Congress. Um, there's In Article 1, we establish the idea of the enumerated powers, the powers that are given to Congress directly in the Constitution, uh, and such as regulating commerce and things like that. The Necessary and Proper Clause, which essentially uh, Article 1, Section 8 says that Congress can make laws that are necessary and proper for conducting the business of the country. Um, so this creates the idea of implied powers, that the Constitution cannot anticipate every law or thing or, you know, uh, power Congress will need uh, in the future. So it kind of leaves the door open through the necessary and proper clause for them to respond to problems that will arise in the future. Now, <clears throat> this leads to a lot of conflict later on down the line that we'll talk about in the next chapter. We're going to talk a lot about the, uh, the powers of the different branches. Um, Article 2 establishes the executive branch, uh, creates the office of the president, sets term limits, establishes the electoral college, um, and how to replace the president. Um, <clears throat> the Section 3 establishes what the president's powers and duties are. Commander-in-Chief of the Military, authorized to make treaties, authority to appoint ambassadors, uh, judges, things like that. And then Section 4 is the impeachment section, which establishes how to remove a president. And that was Ben Franklin's idea. They're actually, the, the, some of the first drafts and ideas did not include the impeachment process, but Ben Franklin was a strong proponent of needing a mechanism to remove someone who was not uh, proper for the job. Uh, Article 3 establishes the judicial branch through the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the only court that is established in the Constitution, and then it leaves it up to Congress to establish uh, lower courts in the future as they are needed. But the Supreme Court will become the supreme, you know, they will establish the supreme law of the land. Their decisions are the, the final decisions in our country. Um, supreme Court justices, you know, are appointed to serve for life. Their salaries cannot be lowered while they're serving. So this just sets all the rules for how government is going to be structured, which powers belong to who, all of that good stuff. And then Articles 4 through 7 <clears throat> try to assume problems that will arise in the future. Um, <clears throat> articles 4 through 7, they're really uh, interesting to read through, but we're not going to go into them uh, in too much detail right now because a lot of the other stuff is more important to focus on. Uh, if you've never read the Constitution, I highly recommend it. You can get a free app uh, you know, on Android or Apple uh, of the Constitution and just read it. Uh, I highly recommend reading it because a lot of people like to say, you know, my constitutional rights, yada, 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 but they don't actually know what the hell the Constitution actually says. So as a citizen of this country, I think everyone should read the Declaration and the Constitution. Uh, Article 4, one of the important parts of Article 4 is the full faith and credit clause, which means essentially that all states of the United States have to honor the laws and judicial proceedings of not only the federal government, but also other states. So this gets rid of that uh, problem we had with the articles where states would have different laws, different rights, and things like that. Article 5 uh, addresses how to add amendments, and the Bill of Rights will become the first 10 amendments. Um, the Supremacy Clause in Article 6 asserts that the federal law created by federal government and treaties created by the federal government take precedence over state law. So uh, all of the laws of the states have to, uh, you know, they have to go with the Constitution. And if federal government passes a bill or the Supreme Court makes a judgment that that becomes the law of the land. If the state's laws do not disagree, it is, or, or if the state laws disagree, it is those laws that have to change, not the federal government. Uh, and then Article 7 was just uh, instructions on how to ratify the Constitution. Nine of the 13 states would have to agree to do so. Obviously, the Constitution is ratified and is the law of the land today. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a lot in the Constitution, so if you have questions about this, you know, definitely email me, uh, or we can talk about it in our Q&A on Thursday. Um, the last slide is just kind of an illustration of the Bill of Rights. In our, cha in our chapter on civil liberties, which is in the next section, we're going to go into the Bill of Rights, you know, kind of one by one and talk about the important parts of it and what they mean. Um, but this is kind of just a, a graphic to kind of help you remember uh, what the Bill of Rights are. And if you want to write about any of these, you know, in your discussion post, that's fine as well. We'll talk about them more, though, in our next few chapters.